everybody, it's Bevan, and I'm here with my co-host, Biscuit, ah, Biscuit Reynolds. Ow, ow, okay, he's fighting me. I don't know what's going on. Oh, buddy, I'm sorry. Wow, that's gonna hurt later. <laughs> I'm not gonna edit this out. Hey, everybody, it's Bevan, and uh, this is my podcast, Bevan, a femme over 40 and her friends. And my cat has never reacted to me picking him up like that. And so I have to say that was must have been a very a no thank you. Um, and today's episode is all about pain and uh, sort of surviving and then thriving, right? Like, and like finding your body, uh, your body's balance, right? I think my body, I've had a chronic digestive disorder since I was like in my, in my Saturn return, like 26, 27 years old, I was a lawyer. Uh, and I can really trace the height of that um, chronic digestive disorder through that law career. I think it was my body trying to tell me this was, I was off course. Um, and I think sometimes God uses first a metaphor and then a two by four. So I prefer to let joy lead my way. And I think my friend Mimi does a really good job of talking about leaning into pleasure, delight, and joy as like a path that helps to create a more hospitable environment for the body, you know, with chronic pain, right? And Mimi had an experience of chronic pain. Uh, my digestive disorder, I did two long diagnostic experiences with Western medicine. Um, and ultimately the first time they diagnosed colitis, which was incorrect. The second time they were like, you don't have colitis. You just have IBS, which is, we don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> we just know that your digestion isn't all, uh, doing the normal stuff. Right. I really don't reject the idea of normal anyway. I think that's made up. I think human diversity is so obvious when you just take a step back and look at actual human diversity, everybody's got a different way. Um, everybody's body reacts differently to food. Right. And I think, I, I think I was so off track with like my life's purpose that like my body was like, no, you got to, you know, what's better for your nervous system living in the woods, not living in New York city. Uh, so like, right. Like, so bit by bit, I learned how to kind of lean into my body as my intuitive guide. Um, and, but I, Mimi has just such a handle on like managing pain through mindfulness. And I love the tools that she shares in this episode. I'm really, really grateful. She took the time uh, to share all of that stuff. And I also want to talk about like grace and the concept of grace. Um, I have to give myself a lot of grace, especially when my pain is flaring, right? I kind of intentionally have a life um, and work that um, requires me to be like on only for like maybe a couple few hours at a time, which is really helpful. Um, if I'm having a hard pain day, I can still show up, right? But I can adjust all my other priorities and get things done on different days. So just knowing that capacity is different every day. Um, and that's been part of my journey. Um, and Mimi talks about that here, um, but also even with scheduling this podcast recording, we changed, I think three or four times, but you know what, every time I give grace with someone else needing to reschedule it, a it's a feedback loop, just like compassion and judgment are a feedback loop. So the more grace I give to other people, the more grace I can give for myself on days where like my body needs rest and I'm frustrated with it. Like now I've had some experience with that grace with others so I can give more grace to myself. Um, and especially, I think our bodies change over time. And something I noticed, um, I listened to this whole podcast series called Who Was Prince? Um, Prince Rogers Nelson. Um, I love Prince. I'm very influenced by Prince. He is an artist I study under. I like basically consume everything I can to teach me more about Prince. And something I really learned from the last episode about his death was how much pain he was in. His body was in so much pain, but he insisted on continuing to like jump off speakers and things like that, right? Like really doing the things he used to do with his body. And I think one of the hardest parts of pain is managing the grief of, I used to be able to do this. And now my body's not a home for that anymore. That's not in alignment with my body anymore. And you know what? Like there's all this stuff I used to be able to eat and I can't anymore. Um, but I've made a lot of peace with it. You know, RIP sugar, RIP MSG. You know what I mean? Like MSG is in a lot of delicious stuff, but like, I also know I don't want to have a tummy flare. It's not worth it. Right. So all that to say, it was really interesting to hear how hard Prince went on, um, the painkillers because of just insisting on not moving and flowing with what the body was telling him. Um, and I thought, I think the way Mimi has done that work and what we talk about in this episode, I think is really going to illuminate that. Um, so just trust your body, trust the signals, because I think it's leading you towards joy and delight if you let it, um, if you allow, right? There's a lot of mindset choice that is involved in this. 
Okay, but before we get to our discussion, I want to tell you about the best way to support this podcast. Um, Patreon is a membership support site that allows folks like you to support creators like me who make work that you value. Um, and I am an entirely Patreon supported artist um, since the pandemic hasn't enabled me to tour, which was a big chunk of how I made my money. Um, my Patreon has been how I've been and my Patreon and being very frugal and living in the woods and not having a big financial imprint. Um, has been a big part of how I've been able to just kind of stay safer at home during the pandemic. So if you value this podcast, I would love your support. Um, there's so much value on the other side of that Patreon. Um, so patreon.com slash FKDP stands for Fat Kid Dance Party. And that is my aerobics class for anyone who feels left behind by mainstream fitness. If you've ever been called too much, too fat, or felt too awkward to dance, Mine is the supportive class for you. Uh, line dancing, sing-alongs, uh, traditional fun dance aerobics, all the music genres you could think of. I love music so much and I love dancing so much and everything at Packy Dance Party goes through the filter of, is this fun? How can I make this more fun? Um, and I love to have fun when I'm moving. And I also think mindset is as important as movement. And so that's why the podcast kind of goes along with that universe. Um, I teach a Zoom aerobics class at least once a week. Um, there's once a month, uh, there's a weeknight class and that's all included um, in the uh, base tier, um, along with updates you don't hear anywhere else, spiritual self-care lessons. I'm doing a series, a uh, course about loving your body and one size fits you is what I'm calling it. And uh, that's something I shout a lot at aerobics. <laughs> and anyway, so, and also for 25 bucks a month, you get on-demand access. So that is ton a huge video library. Um, you get six classes at a time uh, from Fat Kid Dance Party, a 10 minute, a 20 minute, two 55 minute classes, a chair aerobics class and a canna size class, which is slower, more low tempo choreography for use with an optional cannabis experience. All of that plus bonus classes from other instructors I love. Plus I'm adding these really fun events. I'm doing an art therapy collaboration this month uh, with my friend Kendra Street Rat Draws. I've interviewed her on the podcast before. Next month, I'm doing a puff and paint class with Mindy Aries Art Northwest, who I've also interviewed on the podcast before. And both of those are going to be available for the on-demand members forever. So like basically the value just keeps coming. And I am working really hard to make this an amazing way to support your self-care. So 25 bucks a month gets you on-demand access. 55 bucks a month, you get uh, self-care boxes I send you uh, every quarter. I like to just spoil people and send them. I mean, it's highly customized. I'm just going to send you what you what what's going to delight you, right? It's not random stuff. All of that, patreon.com slash FKDP. You're supporting this podcast. Uh, you're supporting this small woman-owned business. Um, I'm so excited that this is my job and I get to do this and just bring you cool people that I love who I think are really uh, have something great to teach and value to add to you. So without further ado, please imagine that you are on a virtual porch with me and Mimi cuddling up under your favorite childhood blanket. Um, and here we are on with the show. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Mimi. Hey, oh, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, mostly because I've told that so many people I know about you and all of the wonderful things that you make, uh, because much of my life is blinged out and more nourishing because of you. Aww. So oh, I love you so much. Okay. So my first question is tell us about Aunt Mimi's apothecary and pimp my pipe and any other ventures you have going on and what you offer. Awesome. So I am Mimi at Mimi Mermacorn. I have a lot of nicknames because um, I had eight brothers and they were just flinging them out, right? Um, and two sisters. So um, I have Aunt Mimi's Apothecary and we have been making um, herbal, er, her, herbal, because um, I'm a her, herbal wares um, for about 12 years. And um, I infuse Aunt Mimi's Apothecary um, items with um, plants that I pick um, around the Pacific Northwest and um, cannabis <laughs> and um, 
you can find me on Instagram and I now have a website whoop, whoop, and it's on Shopify. It's auntmimis.myshopify.com and um, I'm on Patreon as well. So you can support um, creators on Patreon um, that you love and admire. Um, and they have, I have several offerings, I think five different packages and my Patreon is patreon.com slash auntmimi. So you can find me there. And I also have um, Pimp My Pipe which is um, cannabis inspired um, jewelry. And sometimes I take pieces or rigs and um, pimp them out and make them sparkle-fied. And I can show you a couple of things um, for those that are watching. Visual this episode, y'all. Visual episode. This is a, um, a smudge wand and you can use it when you're smudging or you can use it when you're smoking. Um, or there's the dangly kind like this can of wand um and then you know dabbers earrings wire wrapped pendants um we tumble so um i'm a creative of many kinds um i That's love amazing. things yes a myrmicorn dab wand or um dab tool just lots of different things um jewelry is one of my favorites i started when i was like 16 um, my best friend's mom, I went over to her house and um, she had a table full of beads and wires. And I was like, what is this? And um, I then learned that my school, San Pedro High School offered um, metal smithing or silversmithing. So I took silversmithing classes with torches and um, acid and I felt all super badassy, you know, at 16. And, um, but yeah, so that's, I do all kinds of stuff, but um, Pit My Pipe and Aunt Mimi's, Mimi's Apothecary are my main two. And now that I have a website, you can um, also DM me because, you know, I'll always take the DMs, but I have a landing spot um, on Shopify. So find me there. I am so proud of you for having a website. I mean, Mimi is one of those people who's so amazing and creates so much cool stuff. And everyone's like, get a website, get a website. So this is a big deal. Um, and we're glad and I'm excited. And I think uh, Mimi's custom creations are like absolutely where it's at because you just tell her like she's such a the, the reason why she does so much is because she's so competent right and like she's also the personality type that loves to do little fiddly crafts and is very good at it and um, and also you're really good just intuiting what people want and need and what's going to like brighten them up because like when I got um my pieces from you we did some really fun barters uh I always I'm always open for a barter for my workout video series so hit me Same. up because it was really fun and Mimi does good barters and we love to do anything under capitalism like like capitalism what like I'm trading with my friend value for value uh, but it was such an over deliver like I couldn't believe how how much it made my heart burst to see myself Aww. so seen by someone else and so I just want to say like treat yourself DM Mimi just be like I want a special uh you know clippity clip joint holder thing or a dab tool or whatever just something custom for you that's infused with so much love and intention um Mimi's amazing um thank you and it, with Aunt Mimi's Apothecary, we didn't even get into the fact that you do teas, non-cannabis yes. related teas and smoking blends. And I want to tell you, for those of you who are old school Bevan fans who remember me from when I had a tea business for a couple of years, I thought I wanted to do a small product based business. Um, I gave that up, but a lot of people were big fans of my Earl Grey. And I have to say, I make an amazing Earl Grey, but it's not even as good as Mimi's and Mimi's is now my favorite. So like Bevan stamp of approval. I really give an S about uh, T. And so if, if I'm giving it, then it's here. Also, Mimi makes an amazing salvation. Um, that's good for like anything that ails you, like rub it on your body and it feels good. Um, and she has thick thigh butter for Oh chicken, yes. Right. So like, that is, I put that on under the boobs. Yes. You know, in my thighs. Anywhere you chafe. And I want to tell you, everybody of every size gets chub rub. It's not just like chub. It's just anywhere totally. that gets a little musty. And the best, the best cure is prevention. Um, but also the cure can be the prevention. Cause like I think yeah. it would probably it's for me, like it's the, soothing. It's soothing. Yeah, exactly. So if, if it happens for me, if I get a little rash or rub, then you just throw a little on there and it gives it like holds the moisture in and keeps the moisture out that's why it works mm -hmm. yeah um well and then i infuse mine with um healing herbs that are going to help with um you know healing or uh 
If you have a chafe, it's going to help um, protect that. And then I put some antimicrobial and antibacterial um, essential oils in there, which really help for any funkiness, you know? Yes. Oh my God. And the funk is real. The funk um, is real. I mean, I take a shower every single day because I do not want funk. Um, I yeah. want to funk. Do you want to funk, Sylvester asks? Uh, won't you tell me now? I'll tell you if you want to funk, let me show you how I'm ready to funk, but not like the funk, you know? Um, so multiple meaning words. I love it. Oh my God. Last night, um, a friend of mine's flat face dog got, um, a sliced eyeball and basically the, the little dog's eyeball had to get removed because the guts were coming out. And I was like, wow, I've never thought about a tear in an eyeball before. And then I was like, tear and tear are the same word but with really different effects on the eyeball. Yes, mm -hmm. they are. Um, the the um, English language is confusing and different. It's so nonsensical. And we have this weird uh, American xenophobic attitude about English. Like English is a really hard language. And like anyone whose English is a second language, more power to you. I don't have a second language. I'm right. Small. It's, it's, I mean, and French kind of makes sense. You know what I mean? Like it's at least like, a lot of it makes sense in, in my opinion, but, um, anyway, uh, Mimi, let's talk yeah. about pain. Cause you are hella good at having chronic pain and like having a happy life and Thank like you. making a life worth living. And I know you've really worked hard to figure out how like strategies that work for you. So I wanted to start, um, business in the front and then tools, like tell okay. me, tell me your, your top pain tools that you would suggest for folks. Okay. So, um, I'm going to go back to a little bit, um, of information about where you can like really dig deep for this information, because that's how I got started. Um, I was having trouble, um, at fibro and some other chronic conditions. And in 2016, I got Bell's palsy, which then triggered my fibro flares. And I had migraines for the first time that I had never had <sighs> love and um, grace to those that have migraines on a regular basis. And when you, you say fibro, I just want to clarify for folks who don't know fibromyalgia. Yes, fibromyalgia. Oh, yes. And, and I've had that you. since like 2010. And I was, I, I would say, very like um, high functioning. I was working 40 hours a week. I had two kids. Um, you know, I would get flares, but I was functioning pretty well on a daily, daily level until this thing happened in 2016 with the Bell's palsy. And I still have facial issues. It's on the left side um, and facial pain and um, tremors and stuff. I get like, I would say 60 or so Botox injections in my face, neck and throat every three months to kind of avoid um, some of those things in my face. Um, anyway, so I was having trouble with um, these flares after 2016 and one of my doctors had kept, he knew I had fibro and was having other flares and he kept recommending this book by John Kabat-Zinn and it's called um, Mindfulness Meditation for Pain Relief. And he kept recommending it even way before this thing happened in 2016. But when this happened, I was like, mm, maybe I should look into that because all of these other things weren't working. You know, the more medications I was on just so many medications and they just kept getting higher and higher and you max out. Right. And um, so finally in 2016, when this happened, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to look into this. And um, I listened to it like every night for like six months. And um it had just really helped me develop a relationship, a different relationship with my pain and recognize that there are two parts of pain. There's like the body sensations that are coming in and like the actual things that are physically happening to you that you just have zero control over um, a lot of times. And then there's secondary suffering with, or secondary pain, which is suffering. And that's a lot of what we do in our heads, um, the mental story, our brain, our, um, you know, how long is this going to happen? The, the, I should be doing this. Um, I used to be able to do that, <laughs> you know, those kinds of stories. And it's just as true and just as painful, sometimes even more. Um, and the more I listened to and became 
um, softer with myself, more gentle and compassionate with myself, the dial was able to turn down on those stories, I guess. And I was able to be more in acceptance of what was true. And those stories are just a big fat fucking lie. <laughs> you know? So after that, I became, um, I kind of got a little bit, um, dove deep into that world and um, found this program called um, uh, You Are Not Your Pain. And it's an audio book. It's an eight week program. And it's by this gal called Vidya Mala Birch and Danny Pidman. And they have a, um, a organization in the UK called the Breathworks Foundation. So you can do all of it, or you can buy the book for, you know, on audiobook for like $10 or $15 and do the eight week program. Well, I did the eight week program like on repeat because <laughs> I need to like learn. Um, I need to do things repeatedly to learn. And I had been in this um, chronic pain situation and suffering for so long that I just couldn't see any pleasure, or any delight anywhere, you know? And um, <laughs> it sounds so like totally opposite to who I am today, right? Like you're like, what the? <laughs> you were there, but I was, I was there for a long time. And um, I think that like pain medication is one way to um, handle your pain, but there's so many more options and um, being met mindful helps you tune in to what is and your breath can help you like, um, lower your like sympathetic nervous system in order to just relax enough to see what the whole picture is. Um, so that, I think that's the foundation of where I got um, my tools. So now I just incorporate a lot of those things um, into my daily life. And I call them like radical, um, radical self-love rituals. So I, you know, became more aware of by meditating and being more mindful. And then I was able to see the things that did bring me delight and pleasure. And I call them like little delight blight bites or pleasure treasures. And um, I liked, I liked art. I like, I like to create, I like craftiness, but like I put that away. Cause I was like, I don't have any bandwidth for that. I only had bandwidth for suffering. Right. And then as soon as like the suffering, I, I could start to recognize um, that voice in my head that wasn't true. Like you're, you have your like true higher self and your intuition. And then you have this voice that's your inner critic, whatever you want to call it, right? It's, it's not you. It's, you know, a society's um, pressure on you, the patriarchy, like your experiences. Um, your critical parent. It's yeah, your critical voice, parent. The voice of something from your childhood before age seven is what gets embedded and creates those stories. And it's really, I call it the asshole in your brain. And I named mine bitch. Oh, I love I that. Call, so when she's talking, I know that it's not really me. And, and sometimes I don't recognize it right away because it's practice. You have to practice it. But I gave her a name. I gave I call her bitch. And when I recognize she's talking to me, I'm like, that is not me. Fuck you, bitch. I don't like, I don't have time for you. Uh -huh. Get on. <laughs> Will you tell everybody what you told me about swearing? Because <laughs> I don't have any white guy producers, so I don't have to like censor anything. And I don't care to. That's okay. awesome. But so, tell I, <laughs> so Bevan, Bevan says, do you have any questions? And I was like, yes, actually I do. Um, do I have to watch my language? <laughs> she was like, no, you're fine. I was like, oh, thank goodness. I was like, cause I'm a mermaid. And I like have been around sailors and pirates for like a millennia. And like, I, <laughs> I just swear. <laughs> a salty sea mouth. Um, I love it so much. I love that you're using your salty sea mouth mermaid uh, skills to talk to your salty bitch in your head because yeah. not the truth of who you are. It's hard to be really loving 
to everyone around you when you're letting the mean part of you run your brain. And the more loving I can be to the parts of myself, even that part of me, I just love so much because she's just trying to keep me safe. That's why, yes. she, that's why I learned that. Yeah, right? she served you, right? Yeah, I mean, I achieved a lot good. as a young person through just sheer grit and bullying myself. And uh, I know that you can't beat yourself up to success. So I choose to build myself up to success. And now, and part of that was like my body telling me with my chronic digestive disorder, like, no, you got to slow down, you got to rest and you got to do a whole different life. And bit by yeah. bit, I kind of built a whole different life around connecting to my body. But what a good reminder that like, what, what was it about, um, the, in those early pain days when it was like hundred percent suffering, what was it about your experience? Like what got you to like, okay, I'm just going to listen to this book with like, with the, the Bell's palsy, like, what was that? Like, cause you had had pain for like six years and knew yeah. about these resources, but weren't pursuing them. What made the difference to you? I was not doing anything else, but sitting in my bed, watching Netflix. <laughs> And suffering. You're not a Netflix. <laughs> like, like, I, well, and I had I had such a fulfilling life prior to like be totally cut off from like I couldn't drive like my my whatever muscles in my, my face that were holding my eye up like collapsed so much that like I couldn't see. So I was like forced to be at home. So um I had like an early head start on COVID. Same. <laughs> right? yeah. um, and I, I just knew that like at some point I had had, I had had pleasure in my life. I had felt good and I wanted that back. And um, so now like I'll hear the voice. Um, other things I, I do, like I made a list of um, things that bring me pleasure. So um I, I'll show it to you if I have it here, but I call, I called it uh, my radical self love um, list. And I, I just have just a bunch of doodles of things I like to do or had liked to do. Cause I, I had forgotten honestly what that was and what those things were. And so I made a little list, a doodle list, if I can find it. You have so many cute anyway, books. These are my art journals, right? Look at that. You can journal whatever you want, including art. Just make art. Just get a book and do the thing. Stop saving your book and being precious about it and just right. play around. That was from yesterday. This is from yesterday. That, this is from my plants, my um, grape hyacinth. Like I have, I'm not done with it yet, but like, isn't that so pretty? How purple it's so it is? Yeah. It's from nature. Nature made that. We did, a, we did an art project together with nature <laughs> inspired by the black forager on instagram who we both adore oh my gosh she is so am amazing and incredible a delightful um, follow black forager give it, highly recommend i think humans have really gotten away from our inherent knowledge about foraging and growing our own food and like with supply chain meow meow happening like this is the yeah. time plant your garden oh. and figure it out you got to learn by failing and one of the things i also really love about her too is she is educational and talks about why it's important that she's the black forager because like people have been lands have been taken from them and you can't they've been told they can't you know forage or pick lands or fish or anything like that so I love that she um, includes history and knowledge yeah absolutely and is really grounded in her values which I am yeah. really into also um, and just frankly delightful and really in <laughs> being herself on purpose and I think that's something people are really drawn to and she yeah. nailed it yeah yeah and that's that's another bringing it back to like what pain things work for me that's another thing that I I um lean into is delight and joy mm -hmm. so what things bring me delight what things bring me pleasure what things bring me joy because if it's not feeling good in my body you know, it, it, and being mindful and practicing the mindfulness help me know what that feels like for me, you know, because you're practicing. Um, then I'm like, ooh, then I don't want that. You know, if it's not making sense, like some things you, you want to like challenge and be curious about, like, why is that? Why is that happening for me? And, you know, look into 
to it further. Um, did I hurt somebody or did, am I being hurtful to me? Um, but if it's, you know, not those things then let it fucking go. Like it just doesn't serve you. It's not serving you. It's not serving anybody. It's, um, not vibrationally sound with, um, your heart chakra with love, like give it away. So I lean into joy. I lean into things that make me feel good. I find things that are delightful and it could just be outside. Um, you know, one of the um, strategies in that um, you are not your pain is they would always have a lesson and then there would be a meditation to do twice a day. And then they would have what they call the habit releaser. And so sometimes, so you would do the habit releaser like every day for that, for that week. And so like one of them was um, go outside in nature and watch the clouds and just sit there for five minutes, just watching the clouds and see if anything feels different in your body see if anything um, gives you joy or pleasure or delight and um, those are the types of things where I was like you know what there are th <laughs> there are things out there that are different from this suffering and pain that I'm in and recognizing ha having that two separately you know the physical input of pain and the um, suffering the secondary pain that I do have control over. I don't have control over what's happening to my body, but I do have control over what's happening up here. Yeah. That first thought you don't have control over, but that second, third, fourth, subsequent thoughts you do. And so, yeah, and you just have to lean into like, um, what your body's telling you. So a lot of times it's telling me I need to sleep. So I just sleep longer, you know, and, um, or rest. And, um, I'll, I'll talk about like, I don't have the bandwidth or the spoons or the energy. And I think that everything just kind of comes back to that. It's just all energy and we get to decide how we want to um, use that energy. And I've got, you know, if I feel like mine is limited with um, what my body is dealing with. So I'm like, is that not giving me joy or pleasure? It's like, no, out. That's so smart. Of my brain. And it goes against all that wiring we have of like doing everything, being people pleasers, like having something to prove, taking care of everybody except for ourselves. And like, I think sometimes our bodies just are telling us like, I mean, they call it gut instinct. Right. And like my tummy being so painful really forced me to change a lot and listen more. And, you know, and I think a key for me is being very prioritized because I have yeah. different capacities to give every day. And I'm, you know, I want to be kind to myself, but I also want to make progress. Right. So like deciding what you don't have capacity for is prioritizing, right. It's, it's choosing yes. what gets top billing in a day. And yeah. And so my priorities come out with like self, our self-care first yep. is taking care of me and my body and, um, what is giving, um, getting me to like be able to engage in life in a way that's meaningful and pleasurable and gives me satisfaction. So I have to first look into like, where can my bandwidth go? And a lot of times that's, that's into my self care. So I, you know, I start off my day, whatever time that may be. And, and I don't judge myself for it is a big one. I, I try to witness myself instead of judge myself. So activate the witness, let out the judge. And I meditate, I medicate, and sometimes I masturbate. <laughs> These are all Triple M's. We love it. We love an uh, easy to remember uh, alliteration. That's what that is. Um, Mimi, will you tell us a little bit about your story? You are like one of like a dozen kids, right? 11. Ele almost. <laughs> Nearly. Yeah, almost. <laughs> Just shy. A clumsy baker dozen. <laughs> I was thinking, how do you make this a baker dozen joke? But perfect. Good job. Yeah. So, um, my story, I have, my mom had three boys. My dad had five boys and a daughter, and then they met on a blind date and, um, they fell in love, got married. No, wait, <laughs> had me got married. Um, and then had my sister six years later. So I'm the second to the youngest and all the, all of my brothers, either we have the same mom or the same dad. 
And my younger sister is the only one where we have the same mom and dad. So that means I have a lot of nieces and nephews, which is where Aunt Mimi came in. Um, my sister actually gave me the name. She, um, I used to go by Mindy, or Melinda. Melinda is my real name. <laughs> it seems so oh. boring for you. That's right. Did you even know that? I did know that because okay. we have a Mindy uh, in our GGG sisterhood. So like the, the overlaps and like also... I think Noemi used to go by Mimi. So we have a lot of really, I mean, people's parents have the same names. There's a lot of overlap in this. Overlap, story. yeah. So I knew that you were a Melinda Mimi, but I was like, yes. for sure Mimi. Um, yeah. But it's like a I... nickname because little kids don't know how to say it, which I think is really adorable. Yes. So my sister, she's six years younger and she couldn't say Mindy. So she said Mimi. And then that just stuck, especially with, you know, the um, grandkids or nieces and nephews coming in. So it was just Auntie Mimi. And so when it was um, trying to figure out what we were going to call our um, apothecary line, it was like a no brainer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're talking about my cannabis story, right? I, any story, really. I think you have a really interesting growing up, like with not a ton of financial resources yeah. and like making it work and like cultural stuff and like chaos in the home, <laughs> like. You have a lot. And like, I mean, you know, pain doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes from, yeah, yeah. from, from stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> do you know the ACEs, like the adverse childhood experiences um, score? Um, no, I don't. Okay. So <laughs> sounds like something you, you could have, there are like traumatic events that happen in your life, right? There's, <laughs> there's a test. My counselor was like, before we start this art, I went through art therapy with my counselor. Tra trauma art therapy with my counselor and she's like before we start your trauma art therapy I just am curious what your ACEs score is I was like okay I don't know what that means but sure let's let's go for it so she asked me these questions and I'm like is she real is she trying to trigger me I know I that's what it <laughs> sounds like taking that test doesn't sound like a fun time oh <laughs> so anyway you can have 11 um there's 11 questions I have nine of the 11 and anybody that has over three is at like a higher risk for chronic illnesses, dying younger, all of those things. Just like um, a guinea pig raised without a friend. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there are ways. We were, that we were talking about this before we started because Mimi has three guinea pigs, which is the appropriate number because they need to be in a pack because they're pack animals. And I didn't know that. So. Yes, just like a guinea pig raised without a friend. A guinea pig raised without a friend, really, they should have three or more, <laughs> will die young. Like um, they're supposed to live like, like eight to 10 years. And if they're single, like um, guinea pig, they'll probably only live maybe two to three years. Mine only lived two and a half years. It's so sad. Babe could have had such a nice life if she had been in her a pig Mika troop. Anyway, okay. <laughs> we've learned these things but you deserve to live and flower um and bloom and so when you get a big aces score how does that uh, tell us about your childhood and okay so we know it goes into into pain i just love that question. yeah so i had a lot of shit going on as a kid right we, yes my my um uh my dad and mom didn't have a lot of money and they both didn't have a college education and uh, my dad was a custodian and he brought home most of the bacon or most of the money and <laughs> what bacon there was <laughs> when yeah. there was bacon when there was bacon um we and and fringe benefits which i always thought as a kid was french benefits and i wanted a job with french benefits so bad because my dad i thought had the best french benefits because he was a custodian moi aussi i want french benefits and i <laughs> hope they come in the form of croissants and delicious beverages and creme brulee mm. um french benefits okay yeah they were not that kind they were like you know chocolate milks and um you know little orange juices or cleaners he brought home lots of cleaners <laughs> or the shampooer that. to shampoo the carpet you know mm -hmm. shit like that anyway i thought french benefits was the shit um <laughs> But, I mean, yeah, it, I just, those are actually good benefits. If, if you've got mouths to feed, like little cartons of milk are good. Oh, hell yeah. And, you know, just whatever snacks the um, cafeteria ladies would give my dad. They loved my dad. My dad was amazing. Like um, he worked at an elementary school, Lincoln Elementary School in Long Beach, Long Beach, California. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, 
yeah and it just there was a lot of trauma a lot of chaos um as you could imagine with so many kids and making it hard to feed the family and um keep the lights on sometimes and things like that um growing up we would have what my mom would call an nqe which was a nice quiet evening when the lights were off and sometimes that was because there was a storm and sometimes that was just because the lights were turned off for a little bit until granny can come like solve the bill problem and it was just it was just interesting to know how much um our, my parents were so skilled at you know trying to um keep some of those things and protect us from some of those things like we didn't couldn't afford cable right but luckily <laughs> the cable um and like light thing was up right in our backyard so my brothers would climb up there hook the cable on and we'd watch cable you know till they knocked on the door and um we'd be like yeah there's no parents here <laughs> 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 so they couldn't come like take our mtv away <laughs> we also had the fire hydrant in the front of our house and in the summer when it got really hot my brothers um somehow stole one of the tools to like turn it on so they would turn it on and then it would be going all the neighborhood kids would come and we'd play in it and the dogs would like eat it you know and you know they'd come and be like turn it off and they'd be like hurry turn this on we'd like i'm I just got just happened it's so much fun when you can have a good attitude about stuff right and be resourceful and figure stuff out and like find your little bits of joy what did you love on mtv when you were growing up because that's the when we were kids was the golden age of mtv oh yeah i love to watch me some madonna some janet jackson yeah some of the hair bands poison Oh, yes bon i would i would vhs record my favorite videos so that i could see them as much as i wanted and i was very obsessed with keanu reeves and paula abdul's rush rush video with like <laughs> some of his finest work which you can find on youtube now those of you who grew up with youtube oh, his finest spoiled. Work. so spoiled but mtv <laughs> in the 90s and the 80s it was a time it was beautiful yeah. Yeah, it was a real bummer when they would actually get back there and have to disconnect it because then they would, we wouldn't like connect it. Then my brothers wouldn't connect it like the next day. They'd wait a minute, yeah, you know, or they'd have to get the parts, you know, because they would disconnect it and sometimes take the parts. So then they'd have to get the parts to do it again, whatever. Um, <laughs> we were resourceful. And you know what? So resourceful. That resourcefulness like transferred over to me growing up as, you know, when I had my own kids. You know, we used to, uh, my husband and I, we used to say we were strategically poor because, you know, we would have to, um, like, well, there was one time I got a 30 cent <laughs> raise from my, the organization I worked for, which was um, an organization that I was serving underprivileged people <laughs> in Head Start and early Head Start, because that's what I used to do. And I got a 30 cent raise which put me over the limit for food stamps and they took $300 a month away from us. And I think my raise was like, you know, after taxes, like nothing, right? It was like $80 or something like that. But they took $300 and I was like, so I had to go to my boss and be like, I'm sorry, but it, can you backtrack my raise? Cause you know, it's, <laughs> it's worth $300 over here and only worth 80 over here. So we call it, we made up a phrase called strategically poor because we used to have to do shit like that all the time. When we got this house that we built um, through um, the USDA, it's like uh, you build your own home with like seven to 10 other families. Um, we were like, my husband got another race <laughs> and it put us over the limit and we were going to have to back out of the program. And um, so he was like, hey, can I talk to you? Can, can I work 34 hours a week, you know, for the next three months? <laughs> wow. Yeah, you just have to like, and resourcefulness. Resourceful. Those were the things that like I learned um, growing up from my mom. Like my mom would send us to all the different VBSs in the summer. Like that many kids, like you're in school all year long. And then now you have, you come home. Now, we didn't all live at home at one time, right? Because I had some of my brothers were with their their mom and some of them were older, had moved out, whatever. But can you imagine all those kids coming home for the summer? 
like wow. no find something for them to do so we just yeah. went to all the different bbs's from week to week and just traveled around. this is vacation bible school for those yeah. who do not know um, yeah, vacation Bible school. So you're kind of like dabbling in all the different like micro religions. Um, oh, totally. It's so interesting. And it's so interesting how different it is. And um, and all of that. It is, you have to be really strategic. It's interesting, like what um yeah, like it's so weird that like billionaires don't pay taxes because they just can like figure out how to gobble up their money in different ways and like people who like get a 30 cent raise suddenly can't feed their kids and like it's nuts that's all of that is nuts it should yeah. not cost that much to be poor and yeah. and the families that I were serving were in even a much more rough situation right which I think that like in general the path that I chose after graduating college um which was just very challenging to get through to go to college and I at some point I realized there was financial aid but I didn't even know that existed like it's not um heavily advertised at least when I was going to school I I realized once I graduated junior college and I went to um, Cal State Dominguez Hills but now I can't remember what I was telling you the story uh Mimi will you tell us about your 10-day first date with your husband I love that you know me so well that you know some of my fun stories it's a fun story yeah so my husband is my oldest brother's son's best friend so my oldest brother's so my nephew and my, my nephew is just a few years younger than me so um my oldest brother's son my nephew's um, brothers or and my husband were best friends through high school so I come up here I met him several times through the years like when we were on family vacations and whatnot but like he was like five years younger than me so like when I was you know 18 I wasn't thinking like oh this guy's a hottie right but he was like mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he also, remembered Auntie Mimi okay uh, oh yeah, he did. Um, also, I just want to say his name is Jesse. So that makes you Jesse's girl. And you know, when that song comes on, we got to bolt it out and dance every single time. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, I had come up here for a funeral and I met, I, my Jesse was staying at my nephew's house and that's where I was staying. I was staying with my sister um, to go to this funeral and um we hit it off. So we, um, I went back to California and we were emailing and calling and leaving messages for like a couple months and spring break comes up. I was teaching first grade at the time in Long Beach, LBC. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll do that every time I say LBC. You can, please do. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so we go on this, um, we decide that he was reading this book and I can't remember the name of the book, but it had something to do with the extraterrestrials and stuff anyway. So he really wanted to go on the extraterrestrial highway, which is why we chose these other places to go to. So we ended up going to Las Vegas, the extraterrestrial highway, and, um, it was a 10 day, 10 day first date, um, camping in Bryce Canyon and Zion and, um, horseback riding and camping in the snow. And then we come back, um, to, I think I was living in Lakewood at the time. Um, and so we come back to my house or my apartment and, um, he flies back to Washington and calls me in a couple of days. And he's like, I bought a ticket. And I'm coming back down in two weeks. I was like, okay, sweet. You know, I was like, that's sweet. But like, I don't have another 10 days. Like I'm teaching first grade. <laughs> so, um, he comes down and, um, oh my God, he, <laughs> he comes to my classroom and brings me lunch one day. And I was teaching first grade at the time. And it was the kids like mobbed him. <laughs> and I had this one little boy oh I can't remember his name but he had the biggest crush on me and after he left he was asking like is he your boyfriend and I was like yeah and he was like no no it can't be he just like broke down and cried <laughs> so sad um yeah so 
10 day long vacation for our first date. It's just, I, I'm an adventurous one. I'm a wild one. I love expensive. it. And it's a, an adventure uh, and a risk that has clearly worked out because you've been together how many years? Um, so Madison is um, 20 and I got pregnant with her on that second. Two, he came out two weeks later to Mexico. <laughs> and that's when I got pregnant. So 20 years. <laughs> 10 day first date didn't get pregnant second date did get pregnant yes. way, to go. way to go um <laughs> hey madison needed to be born sometimes your kids are just like coming right through yeah regardless of your timing oh yeah totally yeah for uh, sure oh my god i love that mimi will you tell us about how you healed with psychedelics and plant medicine yes so um growing up um like I said, it was a little chaotic and there was a lot of weed smoking. Um, we had garage bands in the back. My, all my, a bunch of my brothers were in bands, always having drummers and garage bands in the backyard. So they had a back room, always smoking weed. I thought, and dare told me <laughs> that it was the weed that made our family chaotic and crazy. <laughs> right. So I used to pull my dad's weed plants out. I'm sorry, oh. dad. Oh my um, God. <laughs> Yeah. So I would pull them out. He'd plant them in all kinds of different places. I think to hide them from me. Um, I pulled them out many times. I think the last time he had tried to grow them, they were, they were in the garage in one of these like freezers, those like big freezers that, um, and he had changed it and put soil in there and had lightings and had a door locked and I found it, pulled those fuckers out. Anyway. I'm sorry. I, I don't feel that way now, but dare, dare gets into you, man. It really, it's brainwashing you. And what's interesting is like, I think now can a parents of which you are one, mm -hmm. um, have a better understanding of how to talk to your kids about that. This is medicine and this is a plant. And like, yeah. um, if only, I mean, gosh, with just knowing how you are with plants now, like what you could have been an asset in that situation. If dare hadn't brainwashed you, like you no, probably would have been happen. talking and singing to those plants and making some really great medicine, brewing up a little apothecary in the backyard, like selling people can a bomb, like oh, oh. at a 10 years old, that would have been, I could have started young <laughs> instead I was yanking them out. Oh my goodness. So anyway, I, I thought, you know, cannabis was the devil's lettuce just like dare dare had intended and um i love <laughs> that weird weird term the, the devil's, devil's lettuce. lettuce it's so good i mean like it's not for everyone and i don't really care that it's not for everyone it's for me and helps my tummy so much like all that chronic digestive stuff i went through with western medicine they never once mentioned candida and cannabis and those two things have changed and chilling the f out all yeah. of those things, the three C's that have really helped me like resolve a lot of my pain. Yeah. And they, they demonize it. Right. Yeah. So, um, my sister, uh, six years younger than me, um, I was 21 and, um, she had, she took me to her friend's house and got me stoned <laughs> with her 16 year old friend. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, um, that was the first time and I got hella baked. <laughs> Like elevate and um but I was still had I, I don't know I don't think I told this part of the story I was very Jesus freaky oh. growing up like at some point in our in our home in our life we found Jesus and we went to church and we became Jesus freaky and so then then it was like this is wrong and a sin and um, I'm probably going to go to hell <laughs> So it wasn't something I like continued to enjoy quite, quite so much. And um, then I met my husband. Wait, can yeah. I just say, I just read a really good quote that's um, teaching people to have an inner critic and calling it the voice of God is religious trauma. It is religious trauma. I have so like, yeah, I'm, st I'm still healing from <laughs> religious trauma, you know, um, you know, I used to be one of those, my parents took us to like, hold up your murdering your baby signs, you know, like, why would you take a 10 year old to do that? Or, you know, 15 year old to do that, whatever. Um, so yeah, my sister got me stoned the first time and I didn't really like, um, continue to do it fr frequently because I thought I was being bad or, you know, I sh shame. I had a lot of shame 
And I think um, re religions um, can use shame and fear very effectively. Mm -hmm. And it worked very effectively for me, um, unfortunately, for a lot of things, you know. And um, then I met my husband, Jesse, Jesse's girl. And um, he sold and grew and smoked and um, kind of introduced me to using cannabis in a way that was um, just felt more um, in line. And I had started to give up that paradigm as well, the um, religious paradigm. And, um, and then I think that like, yeah, at some point he was not using as frequently and I started using more. And I think that started happening um, probably when I had the Bell's palsy. I really got amped up. Like they just filled me with gabapentin and steroids and I, all these other things that were just, I just felt like I was having side effects. I had to take this for this side effect. And I was like, I got to start paring this down. <laughs> and the only way I knew to pare that down was by using cannabis. And because I knew it helped with, um, with pain and anxiety and depression and, you know, um, stress, stress. Yeah. And so pairing that cannabis along with um, the mindfulness programs that I was doing at the same time, really just was like um an essential mix for me um but i had you you know i had ha had cannabis here and there um throughout my life but really started to use it more um, mindfully um after i had the bell's palsy and migraines i had so many migraines so it's like it's really helpful i use it in all the different forms um smoking dabbing um tinctures uh on my body with the salve I make um and, and bath bombs like edibles you name it <laughs> I'm here for it uh, um oh and psychedelics oh psychedelics yes so <laughs> I did I did experiment a little bit with psychedelics when I moved up to um no oh, I did once before in yeah in, in college, I had had one time, um, I think I was in uh, in the mid 90s sometime and somebody had some and I, I didn't really feel much. Maybe you didn't have the right kind or um, I didn't take enough or, you know, set and setting, I think is really important. Um, and I, it probably just wasn't the right set and setting and maybe didn't have the uh, psychedelic properties that I was looking for. And then I moved to Washington and just was much more available. Um, and, and I had a partner that um, knew people. And so I had it a few times and it, it used it more recreationally and it was just fun and, you know, colorful. And um, I didn't think much of it intentionally using it. And looking back now though, I can see that it was kind of a release and a, um, like a reset um and and helped me um get through some tough shit you know living in Washington away from my parents going to school and I was like so I, I used it more frequently several times while I was living here during that year and then um throughout the years we've probably um had a couple little um moments or when we have had access, it's not something that you like get access to like very easily. And then at some point, my husband got spores and grew. And that was a portion, that was a time period where um, I have, I'd never microdosed. And I, I still would say I haven't like done it um, like on a cyclical period. Um, but I had access to using mushrooms at that point, And I was, I I was a young parent and um, I think there was still a little shame attached to it. So I was having trouble like fully enjoying the experience, um, but still knew the power and the um, importance of it helping me be more um, in line with like who I wanted to be as a person. 
um, I feel like you have access to a, a bigger picture when you are um, using mushrooms and things become like significant and insignificant at the same time. You know, like you can see um, the greater power and the greater picture of things. And then also look at things and be like, really, it's not that big of a deal. You can just let that go. It's, it helps you reframe things in a softer, more compassionate and gentler way. Totally. And it's combined with mindfulness uh, practices, like you are the boss of all of that pain. Mindfulness is just deep, deep mindfulness. And um, the psychedelics are rewiring your neural pathways. So you have the behaviors that are trying to get locked in and the psychedelic use helps to lock in those behaviors and like help your body receive more of the healing you're giving it. Yeah. And it's just a time for, for your brain to, to do the work that it wants to do. You know, I think that universe and um, our souls want to be more humane and more humanitarian and more kind and more compassionate and more gentle. And we are influenced and have so much outer things coming at us. This sometimes it's just too noisy. And I think, you know, resetting with mushrooms and plant medicine can help like take away some of that noise and chatter and help you meet, um, see the greater picture and, and, and see what we're really here for. And I think, I think we got, get to choose. We chose to be here and we're like, Hey, I want to go on this ride. And, um, if we get to choose to be here, like we want to like experience it to the best of our ability. And I think that part of it is learning how to be a more humanitarian person grow, growing more empathy. And I think that using plant medicine and being mindful helps you get there. Uh, what a good way to end this. This is, that's a really, really, yeah. A hundred percent. Oh, Aunt Mimi, I love you so much. I love you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Bevan. Oh, thanks for being my friend. Thanks for sharing all of your wisdom. I know people got a ton out of this. All of the links for how to connect with Mimi, including the DMs on Instagram are going to be down in the show notes. Um, Aunt Mimi's apothecary, pimp my pipe on Instagram. If you just want to type it in now um, and a Patreon supported artist, just like yours truly. Um, yes. And I love you a lot and we'll see you next week.